month, 14 years ago. Huh? Um, so I'm proud of that. I also am a Nora Oncology nurse here at JFK, for those that don't know me. Um, I, I'm really just going to have everybody introduce themselves. We're going to end on a positive note before we go and listen to Dennis. Um, it's been a long day, a good day, and I think we'll just have everybody talk a little bit about themselves. And then we'll open up to questions. Does that sound uh, okay to everybody? We're very informal, so <laughs> we'll keep it, try to keep it fun. <laughs> so we're going to start with Len. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can just I'll give you, I'll, yeah, I'll give you a, a, a quick background. I'm um, currently 61 years old. Uh, four, four years ago, I was 57. I was diagnosed. Um, with a glioblastoma grade, grade four multiform, which I suppose is one of the bad guys. Um, <clears throat> I did not have any any tremendous symptoms. I had a little sort of sinus headache for a couple of months and went through some of the preliminary stuff and ended up um, with an MRI that exposed the, uh, the tumor and the edema and so on. Um, I'm a very, very fortunate fellow because I had the surgery which went well. Um, I was um, on a clinical trial, uh, phase two clinical trial, consisting of two drugs, um, Ireno TCAM, which is CPT11, and I noticed that was on the screen earlier today, in combination with carboplatin. I had um, four treatments, uh, 28 days apart. Uh, I tolerated the treatments quite well. Um, <clears throat> that was followed up by the standard uh, 33 days of radiation. And um, my, my, my over, all, the, the entire treatment ended uh, somewhere right before Christmas in 2001. And I haven't had any problems since, no reoccurrences or anything. Um, I have tried to reach out and support some folks that have had similar situations and I know that uh, it's it's more rare than unfortunately common that you get by with one set of treatments and you're off and feeling well. Um, so, so that I guess is the um, sort of the very quick uh, overview of my, of my treatment. Um, since then, of course, I monitored quarterly with an MRI and everything's okay. I do take some uh, vitamins, I guess you'd call them. Uh, I don't take a, a vast array. There's about six of them. I, I had done some research and read a few um, books about what I should be taking, but I couldn't possibly take that many vitamins. So I consolidated them down to a few. Um, there's a shark liver oil tablet I take once a day. There's a beta carotene table tablet I take once a day. Um, <clears throat> there's a vitamin C, um, a vitamin B complex, um, some selenium, and I may have left one or two out. But that's about Excuse it. Excuse me. <laughs> and, um, and, and that's essentially it. Uh, I mean, my, my surgery, went well, it wasn't terribly traumatic, uh, although I mean, it was in the overall sense of things, but, but it didn't um, leave me with much of a deficit or anything to recover from, so I, I did quite well. Uh, Thank you, Gordon. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, first I have to say, if you look at the program here, I'm Florence Marizia, it says tenure, I'm 11. <laughs> um, and I, I'm very lucky like Len was. Um, I had no symptoms. I was out of my sister's house. My husband and I had just put a pool in. Our daughter was three. We took CPR courses in case the friends came over and we had to jump in and save one of them. And I'm in my sister's bathroom and I'm going to wash my hands and my whole left arm goes numb. And there I go, having a heart attack, I just turned 30. And I went to go out, and my left leg was numb, and I fell to the floor and started seizuring. But focal seizures in my face, I was aware of everything. The only time that I lose is how I got up off of the floor of the bathroom, opened the door, and ran to a bed. 
When I got to the bed, I started remembering again, and I remember everything. I was brought to a hospital by uh, the police. But, yeah, they just wanted the ambulance. And um, five days of testing until they told me I had a brain tumor. And the guy says to me, I don't suggest you get it treated here. And I really wanted to say, you know, that they were saying no, Sherlock. <laughs> so he said, I can give you the name of a neurosurgeon in, in, at NYU or at uh, New York Final Presbyterian. I chose NYU. Um, I had to have a needle biopsy done because it's in a, uh, my motor strip. And if any of the normal cells were touched, I could be paralyzed partially or fully. My daughter was three. She had to go to school. I couldn't die because who's going to go with her and her? When she reaches puberty, who's going to talk to her about boys? Who's going to, you know, who's going to take it to do her nails and her hair? Who's going to do a homework with her? My husband's not smarter than me, so I have to do her homework with her. So all this is, is running through my head, and I went. I decided on NYU for a needle biopsy. I was told by the new, excuse me, the neurosurgeon. Um, he came in every morning. This is your tumor. I've seen a million of these. I have done tons of them in my 20 somewhat years. He goes, your, your tumor is like this. He said, a cancerous tumor has tentacles or legs that infiltrate the brain. Yours is like this. I'm 99% sure it's, it's benign. Still have to do work with it, but 99% sure it's benign. Day after day I heard this. They send me home two days later. My husband gets the call, I hear the phone ring, I hear him going, yeah, okay, thank you. And he hangs up, I said, who is that? Oh, don't worry about it. I said, that was Dr. Kelly's office, tell me. And he said, yeah, he goes, it's malignant. And I said, oh, damn, I have to be the one that gives warmer. So I went, we went back to, to see him, and he told me, if you don't start your treatment yesterday, you're not gonna make the five years. Well, I saw him like eight years later, and I said, remember me? I said, I didn't start it yesterday. I started it later, and I'm still here. And basically, that's, I did um, radiation. The, it was a job, because I, you know, I had left work, and it's five days a week for six weeks. So I had a job for six weeks. And uh, then I did my chemotherapy, which I did. I had to, it was once BCNU, once every two months. That had to be lengthened towards the end because my blood uh, counts were dropping. And I ended up finishing everything in January of 2006. Of 2006, that's next year. <laughs> and see, still me In 1996, January. And all I do is uh, seizure meds now. I started off with uh, Dilantin, did nothing for me. I had 69 or 67 seizures in my first day in the hospital. Wow. I recorded all of them. They woke me up in the night. But only my face. Nothing else. No other part of it. The first time I saw my seizure, oh, I said, that's the ugliest thing I've ever seen. But here I am. Were you having vocal seizures? Vocal seizures. Just me too. Here. Just here. You could hear everything, you could see everything, but you couldn't move and you couldn't speak. Oh no, I couldn't get up and walk. Oh, I couldn't. <coughs> I, I was even driving once, and I got an aura, I get like an aura, and I knew it was coming on. I pulled over, the seizure happened, it ended, I took off. I was driving. Right. I really enjoyed when you were saying about the. Um, <laughs> Memory is obviously a big part of mine. When you learned the, come on, oh, come on, help me out here. Sign language. Sign language. Yeah, that's what could I do when, I, when uh, the radiation oncologist told me, I said, what could happen now? He goes, well, you could lose your hair, and um, you'll have memory loss, short-term memory loss. And I said, how bad could it be? He said, I'll give you worst case scenario. You take a glass, you put it in your kitchen cabinet, you turn around and someone says to you, what did you just put in the cabinet? So you'll have no recollection. Said, That's not good. <laughs> and then I said, well, what about driving? He goes, well, you'll be driving, you'll be stuck at a red light, and then you won't know where you're going when the light turns red. <laughs> so I had my daughter, which I would take her to preschool, and I said, well, what if she says to me, if I say to her, where are we going, Nicole? And she goes, to get ice cream. 
So I, oh, I couldn't have surgery. It's, it's inoperable because of this location. It's in my motor strip. That's why I had to have a needle biopsy. So I decided if I exercise my brain, it's not going to fail me. So I went and I took um, sign language courses. And I figured if I can learn another language and retain it, I'm OK. Susan Besser, I'm a registered nurse, a certified health educator, and a nurse massage therapy, and a brain tumor su uh, survivor. So it reaches across the board, whether you're knowledgeable or not, we're all in the same boat. Uh, 22 years ago, when I was 33 years old, I was diagnosed with a meningioma. I was misdiagnosed for approximately two years. I had nausea, vomiting, severe headaches, uh, equilibrium problems, memory problems, hearing deficits. And I was sent from doctor to doctor to doctor. At the same time, I was working at a hospital. But no one thought that a 33-year-old healthy woman had anything wrong. And the, well, the last doctor that I saw prior to my neurologist gave me some Valium and told me to go home and relax. I was too stressed out. So my point being is that so many times, those of us with uh, brain tumors, and especially um, 22 years ago, do get misdiagnosed because that's not the first thing that people are looking for and there's a lot of time wasted. Uh, finally, I asked for a neurologist, my exam was negative, but when I went for my CAT scan, within 48 hours I was in the hospital on the desk line and then had my surgery. At that time, there was almost no information available to the public and even as a professional, I had a tremendous amount of difficulty finding um, information about the disease, about the condition. Um, we also um, was told at the time that it was completely encapsulated and the tumor was removed and to go home and have a very happy life and don't worry about it. I was followed for about two years and then told that there was no chance of recurrence and just go back home. About Five or six years later, I started getting some symptoms again, but I was denying the symptoms because I felt that couldn't be anything, and maybe I was just imagining things. And so 10 years after my initial diagnosis, I was diagnosed with a recurrence. And at this time, it was much more serious. Um, it was much larger than the first one, and uh, much deeper and extremely vascular. So there I was back in the hospital, had to have the embolism uh, procedure to cut off the blood supply. And the second surgery and recovery was much, much uh, more difficult. But again, now I just, on October 4th, passed my 12th year anniversary from that one. Uh, so, um, uh, what I'm really, uh, one of the reasons that I've gotten involved um, professionally and, and just as a, uh, as a survivor is because there is so much misinformation and so difficult, uh, such a difficult time getting the correct information. We um, sometimes don't always look like there's something the matter with us, so or we deny our symptoms, or you know, people, those of us get, that get headaches, we just want to say it's something else. And it's really, really important to follow up and to be to advocate for yourself. In the cases of benign tumors, yes, thank God they are benign, but the location can be uh, just as devastating as someone with a malignant tumor. And if you don't feel comfortable with what your doctor is saying, just get another doctor, or not ne necessarily just get a second opinion. You have to feel comfortable within yourself that, and, and learn what, you know, what is really important. Uh, just two days ago, I just got the results of my um, last MRI, and the doctor just gave me a message from through his secretary that I passed the 10-year, uh, 12-year recovery period, and I don't need any more MRIs. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. but that's exactly what happened for the last time. Mm -hmm. So I'm very happy that I passed that recovery, but I will now look for another doctor because that's what I was told 22 years ago, and they can come back. So you need to uh, research. Spend as much time as you can on the computer, come to these conferences, uh, speak with each other, um, read, and be an advocate for yourself. The other thing that um, 
I also wanted to talk about is self-healing. I think uh, when you have a brain tumor, I I'm also, I'm bringing this up because um, I think it's important. I'm also a breast cancer survivor. And I found that going through breast cancer, although it was very difficult, was much easier because it's a very, very popular subject. Anyone that you talk to has a story, everybody's comfortable speaking about it. When you tell someone you have breast cancer, you tell someone you have a brain tumor, you get two completely different reactions. <laughs> people are very uncomfortable being around people that have breast, uh, 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 brain tumors, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. They're uncomfortable, they don't know what to say, they either have a doom and gloom attitude, or they want to stay away. They just don't know how to react. When you say you have breast cancer, ah, it's fine, and, and the money. Money does not go to brain tumor research. I participated in May in D.C. in the walk and uh, the brain tumor awareness week. If you have the opportunity, it's a great, great opportunity and a great experience. So you really need to, like again, I'm saying for that fourth time, self-advocate. Get out there, get the word out. Try to help get funding for your condition. Talk about it. I found that it was much easier to talk about the breast cancer than it is for brain tumor. It's an uncomfortable thing sometimes for some of us to talk that there's something wrong with our brain. But it's, it, we're all in the same boat. And I've got a tremendous amount of support from coming to these kinds of groups and meeting people online and developing long-term friendships. So that's really important. And the other thing that I just wanted to say was um, what I found personally that really, really helped me was looking into holistic healing, and I became very involved in getting massages, and I felt that that was really very, very, very helpful for me, because it's a way in being touched professionally, not being poked and prodded and having blood drawn and things like that. And I became, it helped me so much that I went back to school, and now I'm, uh, in addition to working my regular job, I'm a nurse massage therapist. And I just found, I think that everybody needs to find something whether it's holistic healing or whatever you're interested in, something to focus on that will help you in dealing with everything that you're going through emotionally, physically, spiritually. My name is Mark Canwright. At exactly 3 p.m. today, I will be 48 years old. What, what time is it? <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, on Easter Sunday in the year 2000, which is five years, five months, and 23 days ago, uh, much to my surprise, I woke up in a hospital in Philadelphia, having had a uh, grade three slash four anaplastic astrocytoma uh, removed. Uh, my wife had found me out cold on the floor. Uh, uh, waking up and having it removed is the, is the way to go. No, no. <laughs> Hard on the people around you. But um, step one that I think uh, has, is why I'm still here, uh, I had a guy with a good knife who uh, fundamentally got it. And um, so I, I recommend good surgeons. <laughs> I didn't pick them, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I had a, um, a father-in-law who's a sort of a retired doctor, and uh, he, I ended up at the local hospital. He got on the phone and said uh, to his some doctor buddies, and they said, get him out of there. And uh, I ended up down at the uh, hospital at the University of Pennsylvania uh, in Philly, where they have a whole unit that deals with brain injuries, brain tumor on a daily basis. And uh, that was probably uh, an important move. Who was your doctor? Doctor uh, was, uh, Grant Simpson was a surgeon. He has since moved somewhere to Wisconsin. Uh, then I did uh, uh, radiation and uh, chemotherapy. Um, did uh, chemo with Dr. Friedman down at Duke. Did uh, Temidor and CCNU, uh, twin <laughs> when the program took about uh, 10, it was supposed to take 10 months, took a year, uh, some delays. And we administered it through, through JFK here, Dr. Harry was here at that time. And uh, did radiation at St. Barnabas up there in North Jersey somewhere. Well, you've done a lot. Yeah, right, right, right. But um, 
have assembled some of the things that are other things that I think are key to being a long-term survivor. And some props. <laughs> Kent, uh, viewing your tumor as a turning point and a useful book to that point uh, by Lawrence LaShawn, Cancer as a Turning Point. Uh, cancer represents an opportunity to shake up your life uh, a little bit. And in fact, it may be a message that you need to shake up your life a little bit. And, and, and what better opportunity uh, you know, to maybe uh, try some new directions. Uh, so, new th simple things to do to shake it up. And this one should be easy. Recognize that being alive is an ultimate gift and rejoice in it on a daily basis. Uh, remind yourself that that, there, that gets to be a trick as, as you get to be five years out. You know, you, you once in a while you forget that you're lucky to be here. But uh, I think there is tremendous healing power in, in, in that fact alone. Just it, well, it, it makes you happy. It you joy. You know, that's the sun on your face. The touch of another human is glorious. Food tastes sublime. Uh, simple things. Then and. and, and and, uh, and even to that end, welcome adversity. It means you're still breathing, for one thing. And actually, I've come to, that's one of my models, welcome adversity, that I find that there are commonly silver linings in adversity if you're patient. <laughs> and, um, and, and, and in fact, sometimes good things come out of adversity. And, and that that can help me uh, from being stressed out in, 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 a, in a difficult situation to just remind myself of that. And uh, another simple way to shake it up. Take the best care of your body that you can. Uh, to that end, which can be an incredible revolution for, for many of us. After, you know, years of Twinkies and potato chips. Um, you know, I, I stopped putting down uh, two beers and a glass of wine most nights. An incredible revolution. Something that I think had a major hand in the old hole in the head. Uh, but, um, and, and, to that end, taking the best care of yourself that you can. If you were just in the auditorium with Gene Wallace uh, speaking, I am a, a major advocate of Gene's program. I think she's a genius. I keep expecting to see her on 60 Minutes, and, uh, and then that she'll become totally inaccessible as, her, as, as everyone in the world is trying to get a hold of her. But, um, you know, her supplement program, but even, uh, which is, you know, it's one side of it is what you eat, and then the other side of it is uh, supplements. Even just what you eat is this really simple uh, thing, and, and once <laughs> you've been converted to really taking good care of yourself and eating genuinely good food. Going to the grocery store, it's staggering. It is aisle after aisle after aisle of stuff that is bad for you. White fluff, various versions of white fluff is basically what there was some toxic yums mixed in. And, and, and you just, you know, it's no wonder that cancer is where it, it is in this uh, nation. And, uh, and that, you know, besides the physiological benefits of taking really good care of yourself, there, there are serious psychological benefits, you know, that you're really caring for yourself. So, additionally, uh, get creative. All human beings are closet artists. <laughs> All you've got to do is take the time and be willing to let it out of the closet. And, and it could be anything. It could be anything. Uh, cooking. Painting. I mean, uh, there's the classic one. Painting. Redecorate a room. Uh, so, uh, sculpt. Photography. There's an easy one. Gardening. A great garden. Uh, I am a farmer by profession. Uh, gardening, not only is it uh, physically beneficial to be out there uh, uh, doing the garden, psychologically beneficial, the act of creating and growing this wonderful stuff, and physiologically beneficial when you eat the stuff, 
that you've gardened, if, you know, if it's not just flowers. Uh, uh, music, music, I brought my instruments. Flo, I want you to, to hit a musical note when, I, when a real pearl of wisdom comes out of my mouth and I just uh, accent it, it you yeah. know. Right. Um, music. Uh, Oh, all right, all right. Well, I, you should recognize it, but um, uh, even to, even just listening, you know, I think that, and I believe there is good research about this that even just listening to music you like is uh, very good for your health. Let alone the idea of like learning an instrument, um, you know, there's simple ones, and and or dance. Uh, there's another simple version to uh, in, indulge in music. <laughs> Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pass these around later and we'll jam. We're jam. <laughs> so, let's see. Other, other simple tricks to be a survivor. Get a second opinion. <laughs> uh, right, I, might, I might not be here if I didn't get a second opinion. Um, uh, I, I had a wonderful knife down there in Philly. But the uh, neuro-oncologist was somebody from the dinosaur age. She recommended me the stuff that you, I don't know, nobody does it anymore, but five years ago she was the last one still, uh, you know, administering. Was it PVC or something PCB. like that? PCB. <laughs> anyway, I, you know, I got a second opinion at uh, in New York City or uh, one of those big places, and, and she said, don't do that. And I ended up with Friedman, and, you know, and cutting-edge cutting things like Tamadol. Uh, Second opinion. Another thing that the reason I am here. Eat a bulb of garlic. An entire bowl. Every day. Oh, oh, really? uh, but the, the, the benefits the benefits of garlic. You don't like how many years, five years we've been in our support group and he brings a bowl. There's mythology that it'll keep gorillas away, etc. But even scientifically, the benefits of garlic are documented. Gene mentioned it several times in there. And, and there is also, if you eat a bulb of garlic a day, there's a certain oh, kind of... Uh, <laughs> kind of uh, energy that's that's also good, you know. Uh, uh, gusto, gusto. Humor, another simple trick to be a long-term survivor. Uh, simple ways to indulge in humor. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple couple such newspapers as this one, uh, The Onion, Funny Times, right? Funny movies. Um, I think the greatest benefit from humor can come through <laughs> uh, 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 any humor that you can generate yourself, you know, with the people around you, is even more powerful than than than, than looking at humor. But but uh, it's, you know, you can pack hours of this kind of stuff into your day, where where it's creating, um, making the people around you laugh. It, it's elusive sometimes. So, humor. Uh, ignore the statistics. <laughs> you agree with this one, don't you? I certainly agree with that. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I mean, I, I never even heard the statistics. Um, um, people in the doctor's office with me were told them, and I kind of uh, turned shut down as I started to hear a little bit of what how grim it sounded. I, um, I mean, maybe there's a little benefit to know that you better work at this. With with all you've got, but but I, the concern that a little bit of doomsday uh, uh, perspective. You should have closed your ears when you heard the statistics of your garlic. In my bag of tricks, oh, um, uh, back to art, artistic expression, my personal artistic expression. When I go on vacation in Maine, I go down to the dump, and I, I build uh, sculptures out of it. wonderful stuff is at the dump. I can't get it home because the dump is on an island, so I start to make stuff there. 
And just today, my friend, whose name I'm sure I'll remember in the back corner, Sonia. 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 There is a art show annually for brain injured individuals and, and the art they create. Uh, North Raritan Community College. Yeah, it's through the uh, Brain Injury Association of New Jersey. Brain it injury. is fabulous. Unbelievable. Is, is, do you think there's a website uh, or some way? Yes, I can give you some information, but it's magnificent. I think everybody should um, definitely go and uh, see the incredible work of brain injury artists. It literally blow your mind away. And how fantastic uh, inspiration to make something that you have an actual show where you could potentially uh, show the stuff. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to get the stuff up from an island in Maine. <laughs> <laughs> I know, we could all go there. <laughs> that's, that's. Uh, other tricks to be a survivor. If, if my ace, uh, my, my card that I haven't played, if I wasn't uh, doing as well as I am, I would find a way to travel. This, this well-thumbed uh, book is called Vagabonding in the USA. And uh, in fact, it's, the author, his story is that somebody was diagnosed with uh, terminal cancer of some sort or the other. He's kind of a Lance Armstrong story. And, and he hit the road and, and uh, is cured himself, basically. That travel is an incredibly potent, amazing, stimulating, energizing uh, uh, thing. A quote, uh, migration. Because every time you improve, every time you change, every time some new challenge increases your intelligence, you have to migrate to find a new space to live out your new capacity, to custom make your new vision. Mobility is the classic stimulus for intelligence. Timothy Leary, no less. Anyway, um, you, know, you say to yourself, how the hell you know, can you travel? You got a life to leave, a job, uh, leave and a job, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Although, if you're facing the exit door, and you're not going to be around to do that stuff anyway. Uh, so, I mean, if, if I decided I was going to uh, relive some of my wild youth when I uh, jumped freight trains, it would, it would wreak havoc in, in my present existence, but it, I think there's powerful survival value in in travel, especially not travel that's um, um, the may the tourist, the um, something that's a little adventurous. You know, meeting people, doing um, unexpected things, uh, rather than a packaged tour, uh, perhaps. Although I'll bet even a packaged cruise boat tour would would have significant benefits. That's. That's my quick list of simple tricks. <laughs> quick list. <laughs> oh, that's okay. We have about 10 minutes left, so we can have time for questions. If anyone has questions. Or stories. Or, stories. or, their, or their own ideas. When I was told by my radiation oncologist that I could lose my short-term memory and my hair, when I came back, I just kept pulling out my hair see whether it was coming down and I kept saying it's my fault. And then pfft, one day it was just all falling out. It only grew back on this side. This side, I don't want to insult anybody, so with all due respect, if there's any bald men in here who do the comb all next to you, I thank you very much. <laughs>
Okay, I've got 10 minutes, but let me try to do it real quick. Oh, okay, Patty, that's Okay. Hi. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to be on the panel, and I'm just so grateful to be able to say that I am a pituitary adenoma survivor. It will be 10 years next month, November the 30th, 1995. And aside from that, I'm also a breast cancer survivor with the Sisters Network, African American Breast Cancer Support Group affiliate with Susan Q. Coleman Foundation. And for me, having a pituitary adenoma is very challenging because I really don't meet that many people. I've been coming to the meetings with Patty for years and I really can't connect with many people, especially in my age group. Because when I was diagnosed, I was 21 years old in nursing school and I was told over the phone, you have a brain tumor. I'm like, okay, I just thought it was a ear infection. So it's been very challenging to be able to connect with someone going through that. Even though it was a benign tumor, it's still very, very challenging. It has basically kicked my butt. <laughs> but thank God I have a strong support system in my mom, my faith in God, and my sense of humor. And the type of tumor I had, it affected my breasts because it secreted prolactin, which is the hormone to uh, cause breast milk, so Pamela Anson had nothing on me. <laughs> um, from that, I had a mastectomy, and um, I'm just pressing on, and I thank Patty for, she's been in with me as one of my neurosurgical nurses. I mean, we got started. Yes, from the beginning. I mean, when you're laying there, and you're just all exposed to the world, and you see this little lady come by to your bed, I'm like, God, thank you. And I want to thank you for, you know, taking the time out and having a vision for me, because this has been a journey. It really has been a journey, and I do thank God, and I can definitely say that um, I'm walking through the valley, the shadow of death, and in one hand, my rod is a brain tumor diagnosis and survivor. My staff is a breast cancer diagnosis and, and, and being a survivor. And um, you can do it. We're all survivors. It doesn't matter whether it's cancer here or here or wherever, you, you know, still, we're all, you know, trying to go through this process together. And like I said, I want to definitely thank Patty for having the vision. And everybody just be blessed. I'd just like to say that I think that if you go home with one thing out of this whole conference today, it's the title of the conference, You Are Not Alone. I mean, we're all here in the same boat in some way or another, whether it's ourselves, our loved ones, friends, whatever, um, and we all have something in common. We all have different types of tumors, but the experience that we're going through basically is the same, and there's always someone that you can find, and that's why I said don't ever give up. And if you need someone to talk to, you'll find them if you want. There's plenty of um, places to go. You know, just contact any support group or on, online. That was uh, 12 years ago, that's what I found because that was all there was. Um, there's, there's, there's plenty out there for you. Don't ever get yourself in a position where you're too depressed because someone else, someone's there to hold your hand. And the one thing I want to add is what basically you said too about follow through and just because you're feeling good and you're hitting those marks of one year, two year, it doesn't mean that you don't need to follow up. This is something that has become part of your journey and you need to make sure you stay on top of it. You know, you're not going to have doctors chasing after you saying, you know, you have to come back to me for an MRI. So you need to make sure you stay on top of it, get your MRIs and, you know, a week here, a month there is one thing, but going longer without being diagnosed could be the time frame that, that there's something going on and we always want to stay ahead of it and it's staying ahead of you. So, you know, I think that that's a smart. And I know with meningiomas, they do kind of, after a time frame, say, oh, you don't have to come back, you know. But, she goes, yeah. Well, look, I, I had a meningioma also and I'll be, it'll be 11 years for me. Oh, November 1st, then I'm fine, thank God. Um, but I just wonder why like my neurosurgeon says, oh, once every two years, or you don't have to, and um, you know, like 
Well, why is that? I mean, we all we all know that these things can reoccur. With something that's slower growing, and as you get older, it seems that they grow slower as you get older. Your metabolism, everything starts to slow down. So you, they'll do six months, and then after six months, they might do two times for six months, then they might go to yearly. And then once you get to that five-year point, they'll probably go to two years because they figure, well, it hasn't grown in this amount of time in a year. Let's go to two years. And then from two years, they might go to five years. But the older that you are, if you're in your 70s, they might say, oh, let's not do any more scans. You know, we'll see. If you start to feel a problem, give us a call. But they do a space it just because it's known to be slow growing statistics show. So for someone that's younger, you know, when you started out, you shouldn't get a scan. Yeah, you know, so that. But two years isn't unreasonable with meningioma. But there are faster growing meningiomas also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That we wouldn't wait two years. We would do those closer. How far do they space in for GBM? We do every two months. Um, what about he's out five years? Wow. Um, we don't usually go beyond three to four months, even five years out. Just curious. For a GBM. Because we had his um, neurologist, the last visit he had, said he was five years out and he can come every year. And I said, no, I can't do we that. We would never do <laughs> At the most. So we set a lump three. <laughs> no, yeah. I, we, we usually do about every four years. We've had people come to us for second opinions that were six months out and we've moved them up and then followed them for that time frame and, you know, maybe go back to six months. But we're, we're pretty, we're pretty consistent. Yes, who knows? I'm more often than I You have a question? Uh, regarding the uh, MRI and many in Joma, I had my first one eight years ago. And I went for the first couple of years at the doctor's suggestion. And then he told me to go in five years. What uh, type of tumor did you have? Meningioma. Okay. And he told me to go back in five years, which would have been March of 2004. Mm -hmm. well, I was feeling great, etc. And I didn't go. And then the following year in 2005, or the latter part of 2004, I started to get symptoms mm -hmm. of Parkinson's, actually. Mm -hmm. And I wound up getting a reoccurrence and was operated on again. Uh, about four months ago. Mm -hmm. Now he said because I've had a reoccurrence, I should go every year. Is that a reasonable period of time, or should should it be more free? He said because I have a. We would a do history. probably. I mean, in our practice, we would do probably six months to a year for the you know the first year or two. We would, might do six months, then six months, and then if it's okay, then go to a year, and then go yearly after that. But, yeah. Let me ask another question. How many how many of these decisions are made by? Insurance companies, rather than the doctors. None, and okay. I, I mean, in our, I'm going by our practice, but I've also, you know, when I talk to other people on the national level at my conferences, we fight the insurance companies. Um, we have a very hard time. Say an MRI isn't even decent enough, or that they didn't do with uh, injection, you know, which I don't know why they would let somebody out with a brain tumor without having gadolinium put into hmm. it. Um, we are on the phone several times because. We want them every two months, and that's not in a lot in two months, and that's not a lot of people's plans. So, you know, we we try to dictate to them this is someone's life, and that's mm -hmm. kind of where we come. And Dr. Landoffy actually gets on the phone with insurance companies, and so we we don't go by that. Um, and Sorry, it shouldn't be a deciding factor. Oh, it's okay. May, may I, uh, what do you want? Sure, sure. Or something you're saying um, in my abbreviated version of sort of the steps that I took. Um, I want to key off what you said too about you have to be your own advocate, not once you've been diagnosed with something. But I think we all have an innate ability to know when we're okay and when we're not okay and all the flavors in between. Um, I had had, <clears throat> I had had minimal symptoms. I, I, I was getting, Irregularly, but on a more consistent basis, just a little, little sort of sinus headache that started in the temple, and I thought it had to do with a head cold and all of that stuff. So, I went to a regular GP, and he did all the right things for me. In fact, the head cold disappeared or whatever, but the little pain would come and go and persist. It wasn't very much of a pain at all. 
Um, sometimes it would be there in the morning and gone in the afternoon. Sometimes it would be fine all day and maybe at night for a few hours. So <clears throat> when when got past that, the, the GP said, let's go to an ear, nose, and throat specialist. He spent 15 minutes with me. I had had a partial uh, CAT scan of the sinus cavity, which may have been the only misstep that the GP took. Uh, he had taken a full <coughs> or MRI, the tumor would have been very obvious. But nevertheless, <clears throat> when I was at the ear, nose, and throat guy, he says, go get a MRI, a complete brain. He says, because you don't have a sinus problem, and I fear that there may be something else wrong with you. Uh, that day I called, um, and they put me off for two weeks, and I said, no, I don't want to wait two weeks. He says, I'm not panicked over this thing, but I've had it long enough, and I really would like to... I would like to get a, get a determination of what's wrong, because I know my body, and this is not normal for me. So I got in that afternoon to have the MRI, joking with the girls about glowing in the dark at night, and this and that, and the radiologist comes out, and he's a man of about 45 years old, sort of tall, thin build, and looks me in the eyes, and I sensed immediately he was looking at a man with a death sentence. And I says, hey, doc, what's the matter? You're a professional, you don't have to... He says, well, I can't talk to you about it. He says, but you've had a huge edema on this side of your head. I didn't even know what edema meant at that point in time. Well, <clears throat> that was two weeks that I saved in waiting for an MRI. Then I called up the surgeon's office, and they wanted to put me off for two weeks. I got back to my guy. He called for an emergency consult, which got me in the following Monday. So that would have been two more weeks. When I had the surgery, which was only three days after I visited him in the office and he had read the results of the MRI, and they opened me up to get the tumor out, I had an aneurysm on the main artery. And I wouldn't have lasted but a couple of days beyond that. In fact, he didn't know how he was going to do this. He had to clamp the artery off, he had to take the thing out, and whatever. So the lesson is just clear. I mean, if you just feel that, you know, it's not right what's going on, what you're being told, you had mentioned get a second opinion or whatever. Get ten opinions. It doesn't matter. I mean, you only get one shot at doing it right. <laughs> and and I think it's very important that if you feel it's it, you would like to have it every four or six months, then get it every four and find a doctor who will um, justify the script to get it done. I mean. That, and I think it is being your own advocate. And if you don't hear from the doctor's office, you know, doesn't mean that things are okay. You want to make sure you call them. Do I need to come in? Do you, you know, are you going to go over it? Most people don't want to go over it over the phone. So, I mean, I know we like to see everybody in the office, see how you're doing physically, so we can say you look good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'll let you that. <laughs> um, but, you know, so I think that it's important that, and unfortunately, that you have to be your own advocate. And uh, see? I think I'm going to have one last question because Stan just popped his head in. <laughs> Me? Yeah. See, unfortunately, though, for us, is sometimes, yes, we do have to be our, our own advocate. I was going through this two and a half years, but actually it was way longer than two and a half years. And I went to many, many, many doctors. Um, for 10 years, I told them I can't bend my toes and I can't straighten my toes. And I went to more doctors than I could possibly tell you, and they all just looked at me like real puzzled. Um, I can't wear sandals. When I go to wear sandals, my foot just falls out of them. I fell and practically broke my neck at one point. They looked at me, hmm, never heard that one before. Um, I, went to, I went to every doctor you could possibly think of. I went to uh, neurologists, I went to neurosurgeons, I went to podiatrists, I went to, and basically to make a long story short, it was chalk that one off, you have to live with it. Um, I had it for 10 to 15 years. I had active, very active symptoms for two and a half years to the point where pick the leg up, put it into the car, and that's how I would get in and out of the car. Um, finally, a, oh, I think that's my cell phone beeping. Finally, a, um, which we call an MRI of the brain was done, but the reason they thought it was, they totally thought it was a back thing totally um, which is why you know I was convinced it was MS I thought I had MS um, and I kept saying I'm sure it's a neurological thing I mean I'm really sure it's I mean I was going to good doctors you know I mean these were all referred doctors and I went to doctors I went, I went all over but you, the place but you kept up with it. I kept it. up with it. Unfortunately, it took 10 years, but you kept <laughs> up with it, and, you know. Can I just 
How could you not? But, but obviously, I don't know. It's frustrating. I just want to give you a tip that I find helpful. I get copies of every report. I have copies of blood work. I have copies of every report and any, every report on MRIs as well. I'm going to have to keep a file, I guess, of yes, everything. I have an envelope with every report. Yeah. Usually, I request my MRIs. I have a whole file. 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 Whole